Thanks very much and thanks for your um, persistence to sort of deal with another paper at this point in the day. And thanks to Riley for the opportunity to talk and that gentle encouragement that just kept asking me, did I want to? And I want to talk about my latest project, my enhanced e-book, Ways to Interpret Fairy Tales. And you've got a postcard on your table. And I'll explain about the e-book and re-enchantment a little bit later. And in talking today about uh, fairy tale interpretation, I want to bring together some work of uh, some wonderful Australian artists who've been reinterpreting fairy tales. And some images will be familiar to you, but I hope that together they can contribute to our thinking about Australian reimagining of fairy tales. But first, a bit of uh, background to myself and to reenchantment. It's true to say that as a child, I never understood fairy tales. As a small girl, I had this mysterious book. Dangers lurked in the woods, caged birds turned into princes, the little match girl died unfairly, I thought. The fairy tale forest was a far cry from the denuded hills of central western New South Wales. Each time I read this book, I thought, now I'll be able to understand it, but I never did. Yet the emotional power of the stories was, uh, was immense. Fairy tales disturbed me, frightened me, and fascinated me at the same time. When I became interested in Jungian psychology, I returned to the strangeness of these tales and found an enormous amount of psychological relevance in them. As a psychotherapist and later a Jungian analyst, I came to understand the power of story to make sense of inner and outer life experiences. I found it enormously real that in fairy tales, children are abandoned by their parents, mothers in prison and plan to eat their children, and fathers want to marry their daughters. In the therapy room, I discovered that if we're able to see our personal history in terms of story, we're much less likely to be overwhelmed by negative life experiences. In my other life as a filmmaker, I'd also been drawn to fairy tales. For example, I used the idea of the forbidden room in my poetic documentary film about grief called The Hundredth Room. And in my earlier film, In the Beginning There Was Shopping, I used mythopoetic elements to ask, is it our soul that goes shopping? <coughs> As an artist, I was very inspired by the provocative pastels by Paula Rago. They did for me what discovering Angela Carter has done for many writers. I went looking for more artists working with fairy tales and I discovered a context for the Red Girl, for Red Girl, the figure in my own paintings. I was also curious about the explosion of reworked fairy tales I encountered in cinema and popular culture. I wondered what is being expressed by the reimagining of these stories at this time. Why do fairy tales in such wildly varied guises continue to enchant, fascinate, and entertain not just children but adult audiences? These were the questions that led me to make my online interactive project, Reenchantment, that was just mentioned, that's hosted by ABC Online. And this web address is on the back of the card. And in the online project, you go into a interactive forest where you find gateways to six story spaces, Bluebeard, Snow White, Hansel and Gretel, Cinderella, Rapunzel and Red Riding Hood. You can find versions of the stories there, but Reenchantment does not tell the stories themselves, but rather opens up their characters, landscapes, undercurrents and transformations. And each story space challenges us to think about these well-known stories and their not so well-known meanings. And there's also a gallery online where anyone can put up their artwork. But my focus was on fairy tales for adults, so I wasn't able to include the abundant, inspiring and beautiful work by artists who are working with writers for children. And also, to limit the scope of the project, I wasn't able to include the work of contemporary writers. Um, Reenchantment also included ten short films that were shown on the ABC, tackling common questions about fairy tales, like why have the negative portrayals of women survived? Uh, what about those witches? Why is Cinderella the most popular fairy story? Why are they set in forests? Why are they so dark? And it's those 10 short films that make up the DVD that I've got um, there that you can buy. Um, the online site of Reenchantment is vast. Um, as a visitor, you can, you can dip in or you can spend several hours there. It's a very useful resource about fairy tales. 
However, I discovered that because of the very nature of the online experience, often my own interpretations were being obscured by the form. And I wanted another medium to be able to talk about uh, Jungian fairy tale interpretation. And so I realized I wasn't quite finished with this project. And so I embarked upon uh, the e-book. And I wanted to see what was possible. Not an e-book, which is a text-based book, but an enhanced e-book where you can put video, images, sound on it. I was interested in what does that form offer us at this time. So now's a good time for you to show, for, to show you my book trailer. This was a whole new um, genre book trailer. Fairy tales capture our imagination with their mysterious narratives and evocative imagery. Why have fairy stories continued to appeal to adults across continents and across cultures? Elements of those tales remain within us, in our memory, and become somewhat iconic because they do enable us to deal with social problems, family problems, personal problems. The psychological wisdom of a fairy tale varies according to whose perspective you take. Fairy tales speak about emotional experiences of envy, hate, abandonment, betrayal and fear. They speak of sexuality and death. Is it this dark side that makes fairy tales so valuable psychologically? Explore the ways fairy tales are being reimagined. So, um, this um, has got some of the material from the short films in it, so hence it's got um, that video component. And you can download it from iTunes for $5. And it, just a warning that if you've got an iPad or a phone, it does take a while because it's got um, a lot of video and graphics in it. But $5, pretty good bargain. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to say, uh, as you can see, the uh, e-book the e organised around five chapters, which are my lenses through which I look at psychological interpretation. Time, perspective, emotion, symbol and imagination are the ways I've been able to synthesize what I've been doing. And I want to make some statements that we all bring to fairy tale interpretation our own personalities and subjective biases, and mine is psychological interpretation. And in a poetic world of fairy tales, it's impossible to say this equals that. There's no one correct interpretation of a fairy tale. And I think that's one of the reasons why fairy tales continue to satisfy us. I think the task of fairy tale interpretation is to make the old new. Interpretation involves immersion in the story, allowing the familiar to become unfamiliar. We find different meanings there at 26 than we found at 6, and we'll find at 56. And I believe that fairy tales work on us whether we consciously interpret them or not. So the first lens I approach interpretation with is that of time, and time for me is about the fairy tale as a cultural snapshot of the time of the telling, and there's been an awful lot of critique of psychological interpretation saying that it ignores this. And as I approach a traditional tale, I try and immerse myself in as many versions as I can and try and see the shape-shifting nature of the story in a similar way that Kate was um, showing us about Rapunzel. Um, and I'm often looking for the um, mythic uh, qualities, that, the echoes that are there. 
And from the beginning, we know that fairy tales did speak about the culture of their telling. But I have to say now, our question is, when we have fairy tales that are being told now, what are they telling about our contemporary culture? And I saw this film this week, and it's very much on my mind about what is this version saying. But that's for another day, I suspect. <laughs> Um, Red Riding Hood's a good example of a story that reveals our cultural anxieties about gender identity and sexuality. It's been seen as a story about men's exploitation of women and young girls, but that's only part of the story. Red Riding Hood has provoked a series of portraits that often ask who is Red Riding Hood? Is she a naive, innocent young girl who's victim of the evil tricks to wolf? Or is she adventurous, curious, playful and brave? Um, there are a lot of artists that I've noticed um, that I've drawn on who were born into or grew up breathing European fairy tales. <clears throat> Jasmina, you might know, is a Melbourne artist and originally inspired by Angela Carter. And Jasmina's Girly Werewolf Project has toured throughout Australia and also to Lithuania, which is Jasmina's birthplace. Swapping skin for fur has brought a new understanding of both woman and wolf as women artists meet, meet the wolf part of their nature. Jasmina continues to work on the Girly Werewolf Hall of Fame and she's working with the female werewolf images. And in a way, this shape-shifting has brought about a new imagining of female identity, in particular wildness, being feisty and sexually adventurous. In Rosemary Valadon's work, we see, like Jasmina's, a challenging of the view of the wolf as the incestuous father or pedophile. Both their work expresses a girl's newly discovered sexual feelings. And here, the way the girl plays with the floppy wolf turns the table on the sexual power and violence narratives that are part of Red Riding Hood. If, uh, in a way, I've called the second chapter perspective, but in some sense, everything's a perspective, of course, and time's a perspective. But in this chapter, I explore various um, approaches to psychological interpretation. And the first for me is to look at archetypal themes present in the story. And the interpretation of those of those will, of course, depend upon um, what psychological orientation you have. Eating and being eaten are common archetypal motives in fairy tales, as, uh, as we're aware. And from one psychological perspective, we fear the cannibalistic qualities of our mother's embrace. We've heard, all heard adults say to babies, I could eat you all up. These stories put us in touch with the dark side of the mother archetype. We fear being devoured, but we also find eating and being eaten erotic. We are fascinated and excited by stories of vampires. Here is in Red Riding Hood, the metaphor of being eaten often stands for sex. Freudian interpretations often focus on repressed desires, in particular sexual fantasies. We see these ideas in the work of the well-known Freudian psychoanalyst Bruno Bettelheim, whose work you'd all be familiar with. And my concern is, that often, too often, the Freudian perspective dominates the space of psychological interpretation. Based on the development of his work on archetypes and the collective unconscious, C.G. Jung saw fairy tales as symbolic representations of problems common to most humans, as well as a portrayal of how to solve them. Jungian analyst and writer Marie-Louise von Franz, who developed Jung's ideas, concluded that hundreds and thousands of repetitions of fairy tales are always concerned with psychological development towards individuation, or being fully human, fully ourselves. I'm interested that when we view sex symbolically, less literally, then being eaten can also refer to the necessary process of undergoing psychological change. Julia Roberts, Robinson is an Adelaide-based artist working with sculpture and installation. Perhaps it's time for the good, well-behaved girl to move away from mother and take her own path to personal development. As well as looking at archetypal themes, we can examine a fairy tale more subjectively. Our psychological analysis comes through stepping into different characters' shoes or seeing the characters as parts of the one person or seeing all characters as parts of ourselves, 
all these approaches are aimed at uh, making sense of the story for ourselves. Now one of the frustrations I think people have is that the more interpretation you do, the more the story opens up. And that can be incredibly annoying for people who want to know what it actually means. And the thing about interpretation is you can't exhaust it. So let's take some examples. Cinderella can be seen as an abused stepchild, as the victim of sibling rivalry, as a passive heroine waiting to be saved, or someone successfully working through loss and abandonment, and also looking at the way she attacks and sabotages herself. Trying on the stepsister's shoes, we can understand more about what lies beneath their envy. Being in the stepmother's shoes, if we were brave enough to go there, reveals the loneliness of her widowhood, as well as her envy of Cinderella's youth and beauty. Through the father's shoes, we learn more about Cinderella's incestuous and weak father. These are just some of the examples of the ways we can gain insight into the psychological meaning of a fairy tale by viewing it from the subjectivity of various characters. In the e-book, um, you can actually listen to some of those interpretations in that shoe section. Let's take another example. Snow White. From the perspective of the Queen, Snow White is a story about an older woman confronting her fear of ageing and death. All mothers envy their daughter's youth, beauty and sexual power to some extent, uh, but the Queen takes it to an extreme. She wants to incorporate Snow White's vitality and liveliness that she doesn't have access to in herself. Psychologically, the evil Queen in Snow White shows us the cold, exploitative, manipulative and destructive side of narcissism. It depicts how unacknowledged envy can become poisonous and destructive, but it reminds us also that underneath envy is always lack an experience of missing out, of deprivation. We can also look at the story from the point of view of Snow White. What's it like to be the object of the stepmother's queen's envy? The Snow White daughter may be unconscious of the envious attack of the mother. Snow Whites often have a strategy of false helplessness and hopelessness to survive the envy of others. Perhaps she doesn't want to make a mother feel bad, so she limits her success and pleasure. She hides her happiness. She may fear that if she's too successful, she won't be liked. Being in this place of victim prevents her from knowing her own desires. Taking this approach further, we may discover interesting relationships between characters. For example, Snow White and the Evil Queen may represent two aspects of the one person, trying together to resolve a psychological problem. Snow White and the Queen need each other for psychological change. Snow White's transformed through the challenges or temptations provided by the evil queen. Eating the poison apple, she is drawn into life and passion. Eating the apple also initiates her into something darker, the knowledge of death. But she also takes in part of the queen when she eats the apple. Is she so different? In the end, the queen's narcissistic bubble is burst by Snow White. But Snow White then becomes the queen and must confront her own inner narcissistic part. And although Miwa Yanagi is not Australian, I think her photographic series between older and younger women do, um, does somehow get at the dynamic between the two characters. Uh, if we view each character as an aspect of ourselves, we're challenged by a figure like Bluebeard. Individually, the story demands that we become conscious of Bluebeard in the dark shadows of our own psyche. Um, it invites us to ask, what is our forbidden room, our inner Bluebeard? And fairy tales often challenge us to look at what we deny or uh, repress. We can also um, interpret fairy tales by what they say about the collective psyche. For example, Snow White holds a mirror up to a culture preoccupied with beauty as the source of women's power. Bluebeard, on the other hand, challenges us to confront our collective shadow, to not deny the sights we have witnessed in the secret chamber, the massacre's horrors and our capacity for annihilation. So I go into emotion, and obviously you can't separate emotion from those psychological interpretations I'm talking about but it's important to emphasise emotion. If we can allow ourselves to be emotionally affected by a story or put another way let the story work on us, we may find new approaches to surviving sibling rivalry and envy, to expressing desire in the face of the envious mother, 
and to confronting our dismembering inner voices and perhaps discover why we might need to burn the witch in the oven. These paintings are by Rosemary Valadon and they're loosely based on the Cinderella story. And she embraces the power of sensuality. Her paintings disturb our expectations um, of um, gender and identity. We had a good talk about um, hair this morning. So, um, of course, one strategy for psychological interpretation is the symbol. And the symbol is often the key to remembering a particular story. Um, and the first step of psychological interpretation to do with symbol is amplification, which is going into all the meanings that are there in the symbolic language. And one thing about symbols is that um, symbols resist pat definitions. And the nature of the symbol is that it remains partly under, only partly understood. And that's a terribly important factor, psychological truth to remember. Um, but it's symbols that compel our attention and give fairy tales their mysterious quality, in my view. There are a great many artists who, as we know, are working with the symbol of hair. And some are not um, referencing the Rapunzel story at all, and some are. And um, Kate showed us things about Deborah Klein, and I had some of her work. Well, just so I didn't stop on there, sorry. Um, Polixini is working with the um, theme of the lost child in Australian film and literature. And her work is based on real and fictional accounts of children who went missing in the Australian bush in the 19th century. So she's working with the archetypal motif and symbol of the lost child, as well as evoking the emotional power of these stories, which is often despair and lostness. Um, in uh, Reenchantment, on the uh, I go into the symbol also of the witch, and. Um, Agnieszka Golder is a Wollongong artist who came to Australia from Poland and in her installation work in collaboration with her partner Martin Johnson, she's been exploring the rich Polish folklore and ritual connected to Baba Yaga. In this work, Frenzy, she's reclaiming Baba Yaga from her patriarchal cultural whitening. And while we can be fascinated by a single motif or symbol in a fairy story, it's always linked to the whole we gain more understanding from linking the symbol back to the central psychological problem of the tale. Even with a satisfying interpretation, fairy tale symbols unfold new meanings over time. And my fifth and final lens of interpretation is imagination. As we know, fairy tales continue to inspire, enchant and fascinate. And um, they stir our imagination. And I think we've seen terrific examples of this um, over the day, and I was really excited to see the Sean Tan images in this context. Each creative reimagining of a fairy tale is in itself an, in, uh, an interpretation. Fairy, interpreta fairy tale interpretation is richest when we feel the impact of a story, when the story resonates in our psyche and we discover the meanings it has for us personally such as these two liner cut images by Sydney artist Julian Milton. They're a testament to this process, I think. Um, one of the Australian artists I admire enormously is um, Kate Benyon. And um, her work is inspired by old Chinese stories which she represents in modern situations. Li Ji is based on a 4th century Chinese heroine who stepped outside her traditional cultural barriers and saved her village from a giant python. And through this story, she's examining the complexity of personal identity. So the mysterious narratives invite, of fairy tales invite creative expression. They demand to be retold, reimagined and reinterpreted. So I think this gives you a sense of where I'm coming from as I try and uh, offer interpreta psychological interpretation. And my approach has always been to be multidimensional and interdisciplinary. 
And as I said, um, this area of interpretation, it's embedded in the larger project re-enchantment. Like if you were to go on and look at all the interactive elements in all the story sites, you'd get the whole sense of what I'm on about. And this is more a way to make it more accessible, but of course it's only accessible now, I realise, to people with an iPad and a, or an iPhone. So I don't know where I am with that. Um, so before I stop, I want to acknowledge the enormous contribution of Rose Draper, who collaborated with, with me as designer for both Reenchantment and this ebook. And it's her forests and pages that give the book its emotional power and visual delight. So, um, thank you.